Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Atlanta Church of Christ in Gwinnett's Sunday School Lesson Series on the book of Isaiah. Okay. This is the eighth lesson in the series so far, and and today we're going to talk about uh, the king of Judah, Hezekiah. Hezekiah is going to be our topic of conversation today. So with that being said, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, thank you so much for the way that you give us, um, you show us your power, you make us rely on your promises, and you make sure we're incorporated in your plan. God, we need you so much. Thank you so much for showing us uh, examples like Hezekiah to help us to understand how we can respond to your word practically and apply it to our lives so that we can make changes for ourselves and changes for everybody that's around us. God, we need your help. I pray that your word would go deeply into the hearts of your people as they listen. God, allow it to bear a lot of fruit, God, as you're, um, as you're off to do. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the book of Isaiah. So what we're going to talk about today is really the second act in a, uh, in a, two, in a three-act play uh, of the book of Isaiah. The first act of, of Isaiah is chapters 1 through 35, where Isaiah is prophesying judgment to the nations that surround Judah. Uh, and, and really just talking about how people in those nations are getting it wrong. They're relying on themselves. They're arrogant. And so Isaiah prophesies judgment in that first act. And in the third act, you see Isaiah prophesying hope to those people that are willing to turn it around and get it right. But Hezekiah, what we see in Hezekiah is he's bridging those two sets of prophecies. And there's no other histories in the book of Isaiah. Right? There's no other events of time. It's really just prophecies. So you have to ask yourself, why is Hezekiah's story in the middle of all these prophecies? The events in Hezekiah's life really are the pivot of the book of Isaiah. Right? You know, they serve as an illustration for the proper response you should have when you see the judgments that we see in the first act of the play. But with his response, you also see that his response is foreshadowing the hope and the way that God brings prosperity when you actually respond to his word the way you're supposed to. And so it's a really good illustration and a good example of wisdom and leadership and especially a practical application of God's word. And so we're going to, we actually see this from the very beginning of Hezekiah's reign, which started in 715 BC after the death of his father Ahaz. Um, The story of Hezekiah appears in three places of the Bible. It starts in, you know, you see it in Isaiah 36 through uh, 39. But you also see it in 2 Kings Kings 18 through 20 and 2 Chronicles 29 through 32. Isaiah picks up halfway through the reign of Hezekiah. And so we're going to look at 2 Chronicles um, 29 through 31 to give us a sense of what the first half looked like. And as we go into that, we're going to cover a couple things. All right, we're going to talk about how Hezekiah drove repentance in Judah and took them from rebelling to relying on God. And we're going to talk about the focus that he had as he was going through that process and what we can learn from it. You know, the second couple things we're going to talk about is um, two circumstances that God brought to Hezekiah that tested the fruit of that repentance that we saw in the first half. The first thing is what I call the test of poverty. And the second thing I call the test of prosperity. And we'll talk about what we mean by the test of poverty and the test of prosperity when we get there. Uh, And at the end of the lesson, we're going to discuss three tasks uh, that will help us, or three tasks or exercises that will help us to apply the lessons that we're learning from Hezekiah so that we can reap the benefits too. And so that's the plan. And if everybody's okay with that, we'll jump right in. All right, so first we're going to start by talking about... um, the kingdom that Hezekiah was inheriting before he took the throne in 715 B.C. And we're going to talk through uh, what his father Ahaz was like and what he did. Judah, under Ahaz's father and grandfather, was actually a very strong nation. Uzziah and Jotham were the kings of Judah before Ahaz. And that was um, Ahaz's grandfather and father. And Uzziah relied on God. He really took a lot of chaos and turned it into conviction during his reign. And he used a lot of his reliance on God to make strategic decisions that actually had him um, make strategic decisions about territories that he was going to go after. And he actually grabbed the trade routes that surrounded Judah. 
And those trade routes actually became very profitable for Judah, and they made Judah very wealthy. And so at that point, Jotham, his son who succeeded him, he, you know, proceeded along the same lines, right? He did what his father had done, and Judah was growing under Jotham. But under Ahaz, you really started to see, um, you really started to see Judah shrink. It started to shrivel. You know, we started from, you know, he started to spiritually, he started to worship foreign gods. Uh, he even started to sacrifice people. He actually sacrificed his son to the god Molech, who was a god of the Canaanites at the time. And that's exactly the same practices that God kicked the Canaanites out of Israel for. And so he was, you know, involved in that. Uh, and this is the first time, you know, in the 70 years that Judah ended up having weak leadership. And so the enemies of Judah, the same people, the same nations that, um, that Uzziah and Jotham had snatched this land and territory from to make Judah wealthy, these enemies saw an opportunity in Ahaz's weak leadership and took it. And God, because of Ahaz's poor, uh, poor leadership, allowed him to be disciplined. And you see that Aram, Aram, the northern kingdom of Israel and the Philistines, took back the trade routes. They took this for, some fortified cities captive, and they took a lot of captives in Judah. And this was all because of um, Ahaz's unfaithfulness. And so God rebuked him. And so you really learn a lot about a man when you see how he takes judgment or a rebuke. And so let's look at what we see from Ahaz in Second Chronicles chapter 28, starting in verse 22. The Bible says, In his time of trouble, King Ahaz became even more unfaithful to the Lord. He offered sacrifices to the gods of Damascus who had defeated him, for he thought, Since the gods of the kings of Aram have helped them, I will sacrifice to them so they will help me. But they were his downfall and the downfall of all Israel. Ahaz gathered together the furnishings from the temple of God and took them away. He shut the doors of the Lord's temple and set up altars at every street corner in Jerusalem. In every town in Judah, he built high places to burn sacrifices to other gods and provoke them provoked the Lord, the God of his fathers, to anger. So after his discipline, after he got rebuked, he actually doubled down on the foolishness that got him there in the first place. You know, he never repented. He ended up dying a fearful and unfaithful man, and he left Judah in shambles because of the way that he leaded. And Hezekiah, his son, he actually saw this. He saw God's train of judgment run over his father, back up, and then run over him again, Right? And this must have made a really big impact on Hezekiah. And you can tell by the way that he responded. Because at the beginning of his reign, from day one, you could tell that Hezekiah was on a mission. He was on a mission. And we're going to read about that in Second Chronicles chapter 29, starting in verse 3. And the Bible says about Hezekiah, In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He brought, the, he brought in the priests and Levites and assembled them in the square on the east side and said, Listen to me, Levites. Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your fathers. Remove all defilement from the sanctuary. Our fathers were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord and the God, our God, and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings in the sanctuary to the God of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object, an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. This is why our fathers have fallen by the sword, and why our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and serve him, to minister before him and to burn incense. Then the Levites set to work. Hezekiah saw the field of, of thorns that had grown up because of the seeds that Ahaz had planted. Their place of communion with God was a mess. It was a mess. The priests and the Levites were neglecting it. There were idols everywhere. The doors were shut. The lamps and the incense were out. All the activities that brought people closer to God had stopped. Hezekiah saw the situation for what it was. It was an absolute train wreck. Judah had been run over by God's train of judgment, and they were stuck. And they were stuck. Now, last weekend, I was riding bikes um, with the kids, with, you know, Perry and and um, Aria, I mean, Aria and Annalise. 
And um, Perry crashed. He, sli- he crashed. He slipped on some pine straw. Right? And it uh, wasn't quite that bad, but he crashed. So, but he hopped up. He was okay. He, he was okay. Uh, and so we got on our bikes and we started to ride again. Uh, but he stopped us. He yelled and he said, wait, wait, stop. I, I need some help. My bike's not working. I'm trying to pedal, but it's not moving. And so I had an idea what was happening. So I went back to see and I found out that the crash had actually knocked the chain off the gears of the bike. And so he could pedal as hard as he wanted, but if that chain wasn't connected, he really wasn't going to go anywhere, right? So I taught him how to fix the chain and we fixed it and then we continued on to the store, right? Um, So intimacy with God is a lot like that bike chain. We can pedal and pedal to try to fix what's broken around us, but without intimacy with God, without that chain, there's no progress. There's no progress. Hezekiah's first priority, his first priority was to restore intimacy with God. That's the first thing that he went after. And this is a lesson for us because we can fall in very similar ways, right? We may fall into all kinds of sin, whether it's lust or bitterness or greed or or anger. And we can find that a lot of those consequences deeply impact our lives. But Hezekiah's wisdom shows us where we can start on the road to recovery, So like Hezekiah, we need to take actions that restore our meeting place with God that's in our hearts. We need to reestablish the things we did to keep the unclean things out and allow the clean things in. Right? And Revelations 2.5 reminds us of this. I mean, it says, remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do those things that you used to do at first. Right? So let's, let's practically apply this. What did you do at first? When you first decided to come to God, what did you allow yourself to watch on television? What did you allow yourself to see in the movie theaters before you decided to get up and walk out? What did you allow yourself to say or even think about before you decided to stop yourself? The question I'm asking is, where are your boundaries now? Where are your boundaries now? What are the unclean things that are set up in the temple of your heart that need to be cleared out to restore this meeting place that you're supposed to have. You know, a lot of us can be too focused on making money. We can be focused on entertainment. But the question is, what do you depend on to relax you and give you peace? Because the bottom line here, guys, if it's not God's power, his promises, or his plan, it's an idol. It's an idol. So we need to clear those things out and replace them with the things that remind us of God's power, that remind us of his promises and remind us of his plan. So a a couple examples. When you get up in the morning, instead of picking up your phone to check your email or Facebook or text or even to see what's going on that day, why don't you start by getting on your knees and praying to submit your plan to God's plan that day, right? To submit the rhythm that you want to have to what God's rhythm is that day. Or, for example, on your commute. On your commute, instead of meditating on music that makes you focus on yourself or some of the things in the world, why don't you put on music that reminds you of God's promises and how they'll satisfy you when he fulfills them? You know, or, or last, instead of, you know, we tend to go home and try to unwind and we'll meditate on Netflix or on cable to unwind. Why don't we actually turn that stuff off and have a conversation with a spouse or a roommate or just a friend about God's power, about the way you can see God's power in your life or even in nature around you. You know, Hezekiah led Jerusalem to do stuff like that. That's what Hezekiah was doing, and God blessed their efforts. And we can actually see what, how God blessed their efforts uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, um, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 29, starting in verse 36. The Bible says, Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people because it had been done so quickly. You know, chapter 29 recounts about how Hezekiah restored the temple and temple worship in just 16 days. 16 days. I mean, that's some serious practical application of God's word. You know, chapter 31, uh, 30 and 31, um, talks about how um, Hezekiah's desire to spread this refreshing that comes from repentance, started to go beyond Judah and Jerusalem, and we actually see him call many others to God. 
Now, the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to the Assyrian kings four years before Hezekiah rose to his throne. And so everybody, most people were deported, and only a remnant was left. But in the second month of the reign of King Hezekiah, he reached out to the, north, to the exiles that were in the northern kingdom and invited them to return to the temple and to God and to intimacy and, and really to the Passover. Not everybody responded, but God gave them back a few of their brothers, a few of their brothers, and he created this unity in Judah to do God's work. And after the Passover was done, all these people took their convictions with them and started to apply them to their lives. And we can see that in Second Chronicles. We can see that in Second Chronicles chapter 31, starting in verse 1, where it says, When all this had ended, meaning the Passover, the Israelites who were there went out to the towns of Judah and smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. They destroyed the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and in Ephraim and Manasseh. After they had destroyed all of them, the Israelites returned to their towns and to their own property. This is the fruit of repentance. And you can tell it's repentance because it spreads. It spreads. Everyone in Judah who had come to the Passover was so convicted that they all left and traveled to all these towns around Judah and ripped down these idols and Asherah poles in order to make room in people's hearts for intimacy with God. Everybody was applying God's word to their lives. In the same way that Judah's repentance brought back others to God and gave them unity to fulfill his word, our repentance leads to unity among us, and it overflows to other people as well. So Hezekiah spread the refreshment of repentance around Judah for 14 years. In those 14 years, he took back the, the territory that had been taken under Ahaz, and he regained those trade routes that we talked about at the very beginning, the intercoastal highway and the king's highway. And that made Judah wealthy again. He allied himself with the Cushite kings of Egypt, which actually Isaiah warned him against. Um, but ultimately, he stopped playing tribute to Assyria. Now, Assyria was going through its own struggles at the time, right, for those 14 years. They were going through some transitions of power, and those transitions of power led to some weakness, and those weaknesses spawned rebellion. And so they had kept their eyes off of Judah for those 14 years. But when that tribute stopped, they noticed. They noticed when the money stopped coming in. And once they were done with the rebellions, really Babylon rebelled against them, they marched to Judah to teach them a lesson. And this is where we see what I call God's test of poverty, and also where Isaiah picks up the story. And so we'll start reading about it in Isaiah 36, starting in verse 1. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. So Sennacherib attacked and captured all the fortified cities in Judah. And only Jerusalem was left, and he had actually set up his headquarters in Lachish. Lachish was about a, it was a fortified city that was about 30 miles from Jerusalem that he had conquered. And so he sent out from Lachish an envoy to challenge Hezekiah. And so we're going to read in Isaiah 36, starting in verse 18, what this envoy was saying to the people on the walls and the people in Jerusalem uh, about what they should do uh, based on the situation that they were in. And so in Isaiah 36, starting in verse 18, it says, he says to the people, do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his, his, ha his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath or of Arpad? Where are the gods of Seraphim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? So these guys were talking some major trash, right? But they were backing it up. They had conquered every fortified city in Jerusalem, and Hezekiah was vastly outnumbered. To any onlooker, it would have looked like defeat was inevitable, considering what had recently happened in the past. So Sennacherib had sent this envoy to kind of win without fighting, right? To tell a story that would scare Hezekiah in Jerusalem into losing heart and giving up. But Hezekiah was not like his father Ahaz. He wasn't like Ahaz. He didn't try to fix his poverty with his own strength. He went to God. And we see that in Isaiah 37, starting in verse 18, where Hezekiah is talking to God. And he says, It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. 
They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone are God. Hezekiah acknowledged the truth of his situation, that he did not have enough to win this battle. But he was more focused on God's power, his promises, and his plan for Judah than he was on his own strength. And so he applied this conviction, and he gathered his people and told them a story that was different than the story that the envoys from Assyria had told them. And we see that story he told them in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, starting in verse 7, where he tells the people, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Wow. With them is only the arm of flesh, but with us the Lord our God is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. You know, this was proof to me that Hezekiah had passed the test of poverty that he had passed the test of poverty. He was surrounded on all sides. He was surrounded on all sides by all these foes, and he was still more focused on God's power, his promises, and his plan than he was on his own strength. And he depended on God's strength to help him out. And, of course, God blessed Hezekiah's faith. He responded to Hezekiah's prayer through Isaiah. We see that in chapter 37, um, starting in verse 33, where God says to Hezekiah through Isaiah, about Sennacherib. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter the city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for the sake, for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the men got up and saw When the men got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. So Sennacherib is defeated, and he goes back to Nineveh, where, as Isaiah prophesied, he's assassinated by his own sons. This is an example for us about, this should also be a lesson for us. How do we practically deal with our own tests of poverty? When you don't have enough For whatever it is, whatever the situation is that you're in, will you wait on God's power, his promises, and his plan, or will you succumb to fear and use your own? You know, in chapter 38 uh, of Isaiah, Hezekiah got sick around the same time the Sennacherib attacked. And he was 39 years old, and God told him that he would die. But again, uh, Hezekiah prayed humbly. He prayed humbly. He acknowledged God's power in that prayer. He was relying on God's promises. And you could see in that prayer that he was submitting to God's plan. And once again, God heard him and gave Hezekiah another 15 years to reign. And in that 15 years, he had peace and prosperity. When we think about God testing us, we usually think about not having enough, right? We usually think about, you know, losing something or or someone that we care about. But rarely do we consider that God would test us with prosperity. You know, by giving us more than what we need. But that's really what we see next with Hezekiah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, starting in the second half of verse 30, the Bible says that he, Hezekiah, succeeded in everything he undertook. When envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. Now, Proverbs 17.3 says, The crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. It also says in Proverbs 27, starting in verse 21, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but man is tested by the praise he receives. God used the praise Hezekiah received from, Babylon, from the Babylonians to test his heart. So let's see how Hezekiah does. We can read about it in Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 39, starting in verse 2. 
Hezekiah received the envoys gladly and showed them what was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine oil, his entire armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say, and where did they come from? From a distant land, replied Hezekiah. They came to me from Babylon. The prophet asked, What did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then, Hezekiah, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace, all that your fathers have stored up until this day, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. (laughs) Look, the current state of Judah was all to God's glory. It was all to God's glory. God brought peace and prosperity to Judah because of their reliance on him. But here we see Hezekiah in pride just showing it all off like it's his. You know, those who are thinking that everything they have is to God's glory aren't really given to boasting about it, right? Right? I'm guessing, I'm guessing here that Hezekiah was not in a very good place, that he wasn't in a great place. And I think Hezekiah's self-focus is confirmed by the way that he responds to Isaiah's prophecy of judgment, right? Where he says in verse 8, you know, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good because there will be peace and prosperity in my lifetime. I mean, he was like, he was living this shrug life, right? He was like, oh, hey, it's not my problem. You know, this reminds me of an old story, the goose and the golden egg. You know, a, fa- a farmer comes into a barn and he sees and he finds that his goose has just laid a golden egg. And he doesn't believe it at first, so he goes to get it appraised. And he finds out that that golden egg is worth enough to pay, to, to pay for all the feed of all the animals in the barn for a month. And so he goes back and sees that the goose has laid another three eggs. And the next day he comes back and he's laid five eggs. And, you know, and at the end of the week... He's got enough eggs to pay off all the mortgages on the farm. And he owes nobody anything, and he has something left over. And the goose continues to lay eggs, and he becomes very wealthy. But over time, he starts to change his lifestyle. And he starts to rely on these golden eggs, and so he gets greedy. And he goes and takes the goose out back, and to get all the golden eggs at once, he cuts the goose open. Somebody said that's not some. That is dumb. That is dumb. I mean, really consider this, right? Consider how you would respond if you knew someone around you that was going to do that. How would you respond to them? Now I want you to consider that it's just as dumb to cling for dear life to the things that we have rather than to the God that provides it. How should we respond when we see someone doing that? How should we respond? God tested Hezekiah to see if he was more attached to his blessings than he was to his relationship with him. And that's the definition of the test of prosperity. Do we still focus on God's power, his promises, and his plan to give us confidence and security? Or do we start focusing on the things and clinging to the things that we've acquired? Now, after a victory, or after you've gained something, let's say you got a new job or promotion— Do you spend more time protecting that new job or do you spend more time protecting the intimacy with the God that provided it? Your recreation time, do you spend more time, you know, focusing on protecting that or the intimacy of the God with the God that gives you rest? Mm -hmm. You know, prosperity, prosperity tests where you have anchored your confidence. It sees if you still remember the most basic of truths, that you're supposed to put the water on the root of the tree, not on the fruit of the tree. The test of prosperity is meant to see if you still understand that. Do you still understand that? You know, we should be enjoying the fruit, but you need to tend the root or both will die. Right. Right. You know, um, it appears that that uh, Hezekiah was very self-focused in the last story that we see about him. It seemed like he was just happy um, that he himself wouldn't suffer. And it doesn't seem like he was really invested in the welfare of his son either by passing down the focus on God's power, his promises, and his plan that provided the prosperity that Judah had. 
And so we see the consequences of this attitude in his son, Manasseh, who became the worst, most unfaithful king in the history of Judah, with absolutely no concept of God's power, of his promises, or his plan. None. So what about us? What about us? What do we learn about focusing on God's power, his promises, and his plan? Let's cover what we've learned, and then I want to talk to us about these three tasks or exercises that we can take on to help us to practically apply the stuff that we've learned. So, but first, what do we learn? First, we looked at Hezekiah. We first saw him repent, and he took Judah from rebellion to reliance on God, first by focusing on the root, which was their intimacy with God. By clearing out all those idols in the temple— He was restoring that connection and that intimacy with God, right? And so this was a lesson to us that to restore our intimacy with God, we need to replace our idols by replacing them with God's, with a focus on God's power, his his promises, and his plan. And so we mentioned a couple things to help us out with that. We said, you know, we want to have conversations about God's power, that when we're driving, we want to listen to songs that remind us of God's promises. And ultimately, that when we get up in the morning, we want to submit ourselves and our lives to God's plan in our prayers, Right? So the next thing we saw, talked about and saw was how God examined the fruit of Hezekiah's repentance with what we called the test of poverty. And this is where Hezekiah didn't have enough to overcome the overwhelming Assyrian army, right? And so we saw Hezekiah pass this test by acknowledging his shortcomings and trusting that God's power, promises, and plan would be enough to overcome them. And so this, in this lesson, we learned that we could do the same thing. Right? We can overcome our shortcomings by acknowledging them, but trusting in God's power, his promises, and his plan. The last thing we looked at was uh, God examining the fruit of Hezekiah's repentance with the test of prosperity, right? where he was tempted with the praise from the Babylonians, and, and we saw that he stumbled. According to his conf- he stumbled because he was anchoring his confidence in the prosperity rather than in the God that provided it. And so this was our last lesson, and really more of a warning to us that we need to tend the root and not the fruit of our prosperity, or both are going to die. And so we, we learn to restore our intimacy, to overcome our shortcomings, and to anchor our confidence by focusing on God's power, His promises, and His plan. Right? And so now we want to apply it. Now we want to apply what we've learned. And so, here's your mission. Should you choose to accept it, Right? We're calling this mission GP3. It's mission GP3, so you'll remember it. And the mission is to saturate your conversations and your thoughts with God's power, God's promises, and God's plan. So let's talk about how we can do that. How can we practically do that? There's three exercises I want us to take on. The first exercise is about displacing your idols and increasing your intimacy with God. And I call it, I call it meditating on three. Meditate on three. So what do I mean? I mean, I want you to ruminate in your mind on three things that show you God's power, on three things, on three of his promises that apply to you, and on three aspects of his plan that just amaze you. I want you to focus on those things. Meditate on three to dispose the idols and increase the intimacy with God. Look, meditation is a huge key to our relationship with God. It's huge. You know, we can use this kind of meditation to make a lot of progress if we can meditate on three. So the next thing, the next task, I'm going to call this the dreamer's flaw. I call it the dreamer's flaw. And it's about, it's a practice to help you, um, it's it's to help you practice relying on God to overcome your shortcomings. All right, so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to find someone that you can talk to, maybe at a coffee shop, take some time, and I want you to discuss the biggest thing that you can imagine God doing with your life. The biggest thing, a huge dream. And the second thing I want you to do, after you've kind of figured out what that dream could be, a huge dream, I want you to think of the flaws that you have that might sabotage that dream, or at the very least make it highly unlikely. And so with those two things, the last thing I want you to do is I want you to discuss with whoever you're with I want you to discuss how God might use his power, his promises, and his plan to overcome those flaws and make that dream happen. I'm calling that the dreamer's flaw. How can you overcome, how can God overcome your shortcomings to build your dreams? I want us to practice that. 
The last thing is something I call setting the praise trigger. And this is really about practicing anchoring your confidence in God's power, in his promises, and his plan when things are going well so that you're not tempted to forget God. And so this is how it works. The next time that somebody praises you, the next time they pat you on the back because you've done something well, let that trigger prompt you to consider how that success came from God's power or his promises or his plan. Let it trigger that in your mind and then, and then share it. And then share it, right? As the Spirit prompts you, share it. And if you can't think about the time, think about it later and then share it with somebody else and encourage them as well. Try setting the praise trigger. Try setting the praise trigger and see how that works. So these are three practicals uh, that we can take on to increase our intimacy, to overcome our shortcomings, and to anchor our confidence in God's power, in his promises, and in his plan. And, and I really hope that helps. I hope it helps, and I hope that you decide to take up the challenge. And I can't wait. I, I can't wait to see the impossible things that God will do in our lives as we, as we focus on his power, on his promises, and on his plan. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's our lesson. Let's go get your kids. Well, good morning, everybody.